Welcome to the Prison Professors Podcast. We serve people who face challenges with prosecution, sentencing, and prison. My co-founders are Sean Hopwood and Justin Paperni. My name is Michael Santos. We create digital content and our team offers individual consulting services. We also assist agencies that want to improve outcomes. To learn how we can help you, text the word Prison Pro to 44222. Again, text Prison Pro to 44222 and get our free brochure. You can also visit us at prisonprofessors.com or contact Justin at 818 424 2220. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Send confirmation that you reviewed our podcast and we'll send you a free digital book. Stay tuned for a 20 to 30 minute episode of Prison Professors. I'm Michael Santos with Prison Professors, and today I'm really enthusiastic to introduce you to my new friend, Danny Navarro, who is here to authenticate this story that if an individual starts making good decisions early on in the journey, that individual can overcome struggles with the criminal justice system. Danny, I don't want to tell your story. I want to ask, I want you to tell me in your words so that people can know who the real Danny Navarro is. Tell us a little bit about what brought you into the criminal justice system first. Um, so my name is uh, Danny Navarro. I'm out here in uh, Long Beach, California. Um, to tell you about just a little bit of my past, or where you know, what got me to prison, or is that? Yeah, I'd love to hear that. Where did you grow up, and what types of decisions did you make that brought you into the criminal justice system? So um, I, you know, pretty much grew up in a, of, a, of a life of, of crime, of family members and friends that were involved in selling drugs and a lot of uh, criminal activity um, growing up. So I mean, ever since a young age, I was always uh, around criminal activity or um, involved in criminal activity. Um, that was my background growing up. I grew up out in um, San Gabriel Valley. And, um, and um, yeah, so I've always been very, um, what's, you know, I, I, I was hungry and, and excited to be involved with criminal activity at a young age. And I, How, when you say young age, that's relative. I'm a lot older than you right. are. What, what are you talking about? How old were you? I mean, I started, um, I want to say sixth grade, sixth grade. Sixth grade. And when was your first altercation with the system? Um, 16 days after my 18th birthday. 16 days after your 18th birthday. So you were charged as an adult. And yeah. what was the charge? Um, so I actually, so I first went to, um, I got involved with um, little petty theft and grand theft auto. Um, and I went to LA County. Um, basically. And, um, and then I was in there for about 30 days and I got out. Um, and about, I want to say no more than 60 days is when I was charged with the federal indictment for a conspiracy to distribute uh, methamphetamine. Were you a drug user? No, I just sold drugs. And how long had you been selling drugs? Um, I mean, I started off at like in sixth, seventh grade from selling weed to selling, um, you know, little nickels and dimes. And then it started you know, escalating into uh, Coke and methamphetamine and um, started, you know, actually selling a little bit more, which was, you know, quarter ounces and pounds and stuff like that. Did you ever have an aspiration for a career or a job or school before no. you got involved in the criminal justice system? No, I wanted to be the best drug dealer I possibly was able to be. <laughs> That was right. it. Yeah, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that, that, that pursued that path. I was one of those people. But, um, you know, life, life takes a turn and we learn our lessons, and you certainly did. My question for you now is when you went into the criminal justice system and you went into L.A. County Jail as a young man, tell me a little bit about what was your mindset when you first got, when they first brought you into a detention center? Did you, what, what did you want to become while you were in there? Well, um, I want to say it was a norm to go to jail. So like going to jail was part of growing up. Everyone, all my friends went to jail, all my family members went to jail. So it was very normal. So I just, it was like, you know, when I went in there, honestly, it was like a reunion because I seen a lot of friends in there. Um, but I was scared. I was, um, I was 18. I was scared, never been in jail before, you know, was around a lot of grown men that were you know, twice, three, four times my age that were, you know, really heavy criminals. And, um, you know, I was, I was just really scared. I, um, I didn't know what to expect, um, but I knew a lot of people in there. So, um, you know, it's just like anything. I, you, you know, I was able to adapt to where I was at. Um, you know, I grew up you know, selling drugs and being around a lot of gang members. Were you gang affiliated? Yes. So you went in there as a gang member. What kind of pressures did you have to become involved in the politics of prison and gang life and so on in jail? Well, you really have no choice. 
Um, you know, I, I have a, a lot of family members that are involved in gangs and friends. So, um, you know, I pretty much ran with, um, you know, basically the Southsiders in jail. Do you still feel that way, Danny, that you've got no choice or do you have a different perspective now? No way. No way. You always have a choice? Yes. Absolutely. You always have a choice. That's what we teach at prison professors, that regardless of what struggle you're going through now, you can choose to become successful or you can choose to stay on that cycle that this system of mass incarceration derails life for so many people. And you are the epitome of a success. And I think what we'd like to turn to now, Danny, is to hear a little bit about your prison journey. What was your experience like going through the prison system? Um, well, you know, so I was, when I first went in, I mean, I, I was sentenced to a year and I got 30 days in LA County and I felt that was the end of the road, world. I felt like those 30 days were just super, super long. Um, well, you know, and then I, I was released and then I, I um, was sentenced to 120 months. Um, it was a mandatory minimum. I was not able to get anything less than that. And um, so when I got sentenced and convicted, it took about a year and a half uh, um, to get sentenced. Um, I was fighting my case. I was looking about 15 years and um, getting 120 months was a deal. Um, but I let's, let's talk a little about something. You said something that some of our viewers may not really understand, and that was the mandatory minimum, which is normal for you and me. But give our readers and our listeners an understanding of what is a mandatory minimum sentence. Well, with the, the crime that I committed, that was the minimum that I was able to get um, with the amount of drugs and, um, that I was charged for. Excellent. So the, so the crime itself comes with some parameters that in your case is the amount, the quantity of drugs, which results in the judge not being able to sentence you to less than 120 months. That was a deal. That was the deal. So... That's the mandatory minimum sentence. So you're only, what, eight, 19 years old or 18 years old? when you, I was still 18. You were 18 years old, bam, hammered with a 120-month sentence. You're going into prison. What's going through the mindset at that stage? Um, I, th I thought it was the end of the world. Um, I could not see myself being 30 years old and coming out of prison. I thought that. Uh, I thought it was over. I just I, I had no hope. Um, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what was going to come out of it. I just knew that I was going to be 30 years old when I got out. And I just couldn't, put, I couldn't wrap my mind, my mind around that. Tell us a little bit about where you went. You started off, where did you start off as a federal prisoner? Um, I went to um, MDC Los Angeles. MDC Los Angeles, the Metropolitan Detention Center in downtown Los Angeles is where you start out. That's an administrative facility for those who don't know. It means it holds people who are charged with terrorism to people who are charged with uh, putting a fake postage stamp on an envelope. So you're really in the mix. It's run as an administrative facility yeah. and you're, 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 you're as a young guy in there. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, the funny thing is I used to pass by this building every day and I never knew that it was a detention center. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, um, I, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know anything about the federal laws. I didn't know what, you know, I didn't know anything. I, I, um, and that's like the key too is like, uh, really no one ever educated me that how serious and severe these case, how the, these crimes were that I was doing. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, I was, I was scared. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, Understandable. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it's just like anything you just adapt to wherever you're at. Um, and um, so I stood there for about I mean, a little about, about a year and a half, roughly, um, to I was convicted. A year and a half you're convicted. Did you have a federal defender or did you retain counsel? Um, I had a, a, a federal defender. Were you happy with your federal defender? No. Why? Um, well, you know, it goes back. I didn't, I wasn't educated on, on how serious the laws were. So I was, you know, hoping to get a lesser crime, but it seems like that was, you know, that was the deal that they were telling me to take because they wanted to give me more time. What could your federal defender have done to make you feel more confident about what was happening in your life at that time? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, you know, I, 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 you know, the, I, I guess it just, um, to, to fight for me that, you know, I was young and that it was my first time and that I, you know, deserve the second chance and not a, a, a severe amount of time that I received. So it's interesting. I will, will tell you, I've got a, a great, I'll, I'll 
preface this by saying I have a huge admiration for federal defenders. I know they've got a very tough job because their resources are not as high as the prosecutors. And unfortunately, when they're working with somebody who doesn't understand how the system works, they don't really know how the system ties a federal defender's hands. Now, on the other hand, the federal defenders at least have the ability to be honest. They have the ability to tell a defendant what the reality is rather than what the defendant wants to hear. I, on the other hand, unlike you, was young and went into the prison system. I had a lot of money when I was a kid from selling Coke and I hired an attorney and my attorney told me what I wanted to hear, Danny, not what I needed to hear. And because my attorney told me what I wanted to hear, I did fight. And because I fought, I got 45 years. I got to tell you, I'm very happy that you got 10 years, as tough as it is, because you've come out successfully and you were able to weather the storm. And now you're a young man just crushing it in LA real estate. And it's a phenomenal story of success that so many people can learn from. Whereas if you'd had an attorney who fought for you, even though he knew the system is set up to, dis- to, to set you on a path of failure, you may have gotten somebody said, wow, he really fought for me, but boom, you got a 20 year sentence, mm-hmm. right? So in retrospect, you can look at it and say, did he do me right by telling me to plead guilty? Look, you don't have a case. Let's get this on. Because if you had you taken a different approach, it had been a little more difficult for you to get some type of maybe mitigation effort or something. But as you said, at the end of the day, the judge could not give you less than 120 months. And that's what you got as low as you possibly could have gotten. And you know what, Michael? Um, I actually had another lawyer prior to that, but um, it was a conflict of interest with people on my case. So they assigned me somebody else. But that first uh, public defender wanted to go to trial. And I was 100% ready to go to trial. I'm like, let's go. Um, I'm, I'm innocent. I'm going to beat them. I'm young, this and that. And then um, about maybe 30, 40 days into that, they re- assigned me a new uh, public defender. And this other one said, you're crazy. Take this time, 10 years. I'm glad, that, I'm glad that he did, but that's beside the point. The real, the real point of this story, Danny, is that you are a man who faced struggle, faced adversity. You can't really uh, underestimate the pressure of being 18 years old and confronted with, an, with a 10-year sentence, even though I'm sitting here saying, hey, a 10-year deal is pretty good for a guy who's convicted of drugs, particularly one that would face the wrath of a probation officer who in a pre-sentence investigation report, we suspect this guy's been dealing drugs since he was 12, you know, it, it can hurt you. So the reality is you are where you are and you didn't get here by accident. You got here because of good decisions that you made. Tell us when you started making those kinds of decisions that put you on this path to success. Um, you know, I, I, um, I, so I want to say about two years, two and a half years into my sentence, I decided to make um, to change the way I was going to come out. And basically, where did you go to prison? Um, so I went to Victorville for a few months and then from Victorville, I went to Lombok and then I stood there for the remainder of my sentence. When you said Victorville, you were in the medium or the USP? The medium. And that was just in the holding for like a few months. So you were there as a holdover. Yeah. Then they sent you to Lompoc. Did they send you to the medium, the low or the camp? The medium because they, they actually messed up my, um, my paperwork. And I stood in there for about eight months. Um, and then I was released to low. The good news about being in a medium for eight months is that once you get to a low, you really appreciate the, 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 the liberty. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but you know, it, I, it, it was the best thing that happened to me. Um, I would not change anything in my life. Like I'm so happy with getting the 10 years. Um, awesome. That's a great, that's a great testimonial to the Bureau of Prisons. Tell us why. <laughs> um, well, you know, I mean, I am who I am here today. Um, you know, two and a half years into my sense, I decided to make a difference and come out better than how I was going to come in. Tell us I, about the first two and a half years. Um, I just was hanging around, hanging around with the guys, um, messing around, not doing anything, just lifting weights, staying in yeah. shape, playing a lot of spades and dominoes, watching a lot, keeping up with the Kardashians. Just hanging out, just chilling. Did you have your own seat in the TV room? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. So, so so something happens two and a half years later. What is it? Do you meet a mentor? Do you read a book? Tell me the turning point. Yeah. So um, I was reading a novel and um, I was on my bunk and um, a guy, a gentleman told me, you know, stop reading that junk. And I'm all like, what do you want me to read? Are you in the medium or the low at that time? I was the low. 
You're at the low. So, so a fellow that you respected suggested that you change your reading habits. Yeah, and I and yeah, and um, and he threw me the book "Think and Grow Rich" by Napoleon Hill. Oh, great! And um, that was a game changer. I never read any book on personal development, self growth. It was like something new, and I just gravitated to it. And then from there, I mean, I just that was the journey of uh, my 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 personal growth on self development. And so what other books had an inspiration upon you while you were in the, the federal prison at Lompoc? Uh, a lot of my big mentors were, um, you know, Napoleon Hill, Tony Robbins, and uh, Zig Ziglar and Les Brown. So Zig Ziglar says some, one quote that I really like is, if you help enough people get what they want, yeah. you can get everything you want. Danny, what do you want? Um, you know, I just really want to help um, I'm really passionate in giving back to the kids. I, I speak at high schools. I speak at juvenile halls. I speak at continuation schools. Um, I, every time I go there, I see myself. And at least if I can go in there and change somebody's life and change their direction um, is a blessing to me. Because, no, I didn't have that out there. I didn't have any mentors telling me to do something else in my life. Well, you're a role model now to many, including me. And the, one of the reasons that I consider you a role model, Danny, is because you came out of prison. After, and what year did you get out? 2012. You came out of prison in 2012, and you didn't give up. You didn't revert to a life of crime, but instead you created your own path. And I'd love for you to tell our audience, let's spend the rest of this time talking about this extraordinary path that you created. Tell us what you did. Um, well... I, life was tough when I was released. I didn't know how to ride a bus. I didn't know how to text. I didn't have an email. I didn't know how to do anything. Um, I never had a job. Um, yeah, it was so tough for me. I mean, the world would just, just slam me in the face. Did you have any money? No money. Did Family. you have any credit? No. Did you have a place to live? Um, yes, I did. I went back to my mother's house. You went back to your well, mother's house. And how long did it take before you were able to find a job? Um, I want to say about maybe like six, like six months. And what job did you find? Um, my first job was landscaping. And how long did you work as a landscaper? About 90 days. And then what? Um, uh, from there I went to multiple jobs, warehouse jobs, and then I had, um, um, Costco job and, um, those were in construction and then, um, trucking. How did you answer the question when people said, do you have a criminal background? I lied. You lied. And how did that work out for you? Um, you know what? I got my job. I got a job at Costco. <laughs> I got a job at Costco. Well, it said if I ever got any convicted of uh, uh, the question, I didn't lie because it was more than seven years. So, okay. Well, there you go. They asked uh, the question wrong. You answer the question the way they asked it. Exactly. Yeah. So that was it. And then um, I, I got a job at Costco and I thought that was like, it was not, a, I knew it wasn't a dream job, but it was a good job. Could be. It's a stepping stone to greatness for a lot of people making a million dollars a year at Costco. No, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, multiple jobs, but I was struggling. I was getting used to life. I was getting used to being out in the real world. So when did you make the decision to pursue the career, the path that you're on right now? Um, I, in, inside, I wanted to do real estate. I was inspired by real estate. I was the, the, inspired by homes and um, development and um, He's taking a call right now. He's got, he's, got, he's got leads coming in. He's looking at deals. He's, he's counting commissions right there. Um, yeah, so I was always inspired to do it. So when I came out, um, you know, I, I, I pursued that. I pursued my real estate and uh, I failed many well, times. Well, how did you do that, Danny? Did you, did you, how did you go about becoming a licensed real estate agent? Okay. Um, well, I reached out to somebody on uh, Instagram um, that was um, out of Newport Beach, one of my, my, my first mentors, my, my first coach. A guy from prison or somebody you knew before? No, actually, I met him on Instagram, on social media that I'd never been on. Okay. Um, you know, he was willing to give me a shot and, and be his assistant. Um, was he a real estate agent? Yes, he's been in the business for about 15 years. So he's a real estate agent down in Newport Beach selling high-end real estate? Yep, luxury real estate. And he asked you, why, why I want you to work with me in what capacity? Yeah, uh, well, he gave me a shot, um, you know, and I, and I appreciate him and all that. What help. kind of shot did he give you? Um, as an assistant, I mean, he knew my background. 
he knew where I came from. Um, you know, he, he had similar family members that were his father, actually his father was in, um, in prison. So he knew how it was um, and took me in, you know, didn't judge me, didn't uh, judge me where I came from. What did you do for him? Uh, paperwork. Uh, in the it. office or in the, it's doing open houses and things like that? Not open houses, just, you know, maybe putting signs up, um, stuff like that. But um, more paperwork, an answering phone calls, um, emails and stuff like that. How are you, how is he compensating you? Um, hourly or, you know, based on depending hourly uh, bonuses. Okay. And when do you make the switch to start pursuing your own license? I already did. I was already doing it. Um, so I, I failed multiple times on the test. Um, and um, so the way it works is that they make you pass the test first before you can, um, before they, they tell you that I can either, they, they're going to grant me my license or not. So automatically, since I have a felony, that's out the door. Um, and the, so um, it took about, I want to say 13, 14 months to finally get my license. But it was a, it was, um, a pursuit. They, uh, I had to meet multiple times with um, um, the special investigators at the Department of Real Estate. Uh, I, I had to meet, I had to go in front of a judge and tell my testimony of my life because um, they kept denying me and I didn't give up. And um, they kept on telling me, no, they'll call me and tell me, you sure you want to do this? Um, just wait till you get off probation. It'll be better in 2017. And this is 2014. They're like, just wait. And they're like, you're never going to get it. Um, and I'm like, no, let's go. Let's um, just keep um, filing the paperwork. And, um, you know, went from a, um, interviewing them, recording the whole interviewing and asking me millions of questions. And I never knew if I was going to get my license or not. I never knew because I didn't know anybody that was that ever had a license. But the thing is that I never gave up. Um, I didn't give up, and I, I have a very high faith in God, and I knew God was going to provide, and, and, it, and he was going to make it happen. And tell me some of the questions that they asked. Um, they wanted to know in detail of what I did, every crime that I did. They wanted, and did you lie then as well, or did you decide? You, tell yeah. us about what you, how you answered that. Um, I would just, the, the, depending on what they asked me, um, um, on the questions, what I'd done in part of the, the um, charges that I did. And, and I take 100% responsibility for what I did. I made a mistake. I sold drugs. But I didn't know any better at 18, at 16, 17, 18. A hundred percent. I made a mistake. So, so let me ask you something. You're a real estate agent now for how many years? Um, I'm going on two years, nine months. So on nearly three years. And when would you tell our audience that you began the path toward becoming a successful real estate agent? Um, well, Was it when you met the mentor? Yeah, I met the mentor and I started going to seminars. I started going to real estate seminars, personal growth, self-development, all these seminars that I was just dying to go to when I was to read the book. So, so my, my rebuttal to that, Danny, is that you started becoming a successful real estate agent back when you were two and a half years into your prison term and you picked up a book by Napoleon Hill and started yeah. to read The Pattern of Success. That was the first book and I love that book. That was, that was the first book everything. and then I'm sure that there were many books that taught you how to do what you are doing right now so incredibly well, which is articulating your story, which is persuading people to believe in you. And by doing that, you are able to open new doors and new opportunities. But had you not made a commitment to reading the right books, to yeah. developing your communication skills, to developing your value system and your, your pursuit of excellence, there's no telling what your life would be like. And that's yeah. why your message is so valuable to young people who are going into the prison system. And Michael, I didn't even know how to read. You didn't even know how to read. You told me that you, uh, that you connected with my, uh, with my good buddy, uh, Gordon Watt, while you were in prison. Is that right? Yes, Gordon Watt. Tell me about what your relationship with Gordon Watt. Um, I mean, you know, there, you, you, you gravitate towards people that are on the same path, that are ambitious and want to do something outside of prison. And Gordon is now, what is, tell us a little bit about what Gordon's doing right now. Do you know? Um, I do not know, but I mean, he's doing something good. I know he's doing, he's got a lot going on, so. And you've got a lot going on. Tell us a little bit about your career. How are sales? Sales is excellent. First year, crushed it. Rookie of the year. Rookie uh, of the year. What does that mean, crushed it? Help our audience, many of whom want to grow up to be Danny Navarro. Tell us a little bit about what does that mean? What did you, how much real estate did you sell in year one? 
Um, I sold about, I think about 4.5 million around there in volume. Um, average, you know, average realtor only sells about four homes a year. Um, so in, yeah, at first year I was just hungry. I was excited. I was motivated. I was just, you know, ambitious to, to make a difference for myself and others. Well, you've certainly done that and you continue to do that. And I know that you are passionate about working with young people. In fact, I've seen your work with photographs of you inside of a school teaching. I'd love for you to tell our audience a little bit about how you're doing that. Um, well, I, I just started reaching out. I did, um, well, you know what? I actually started doing that the last year, year and a half in prison. Um, I was involved in a program where kids would come in. And I was able to connect with them because I was so young. Um, but I mean, I, I, I'm very passionate, very, very, very passionate giving back to the youth, um, at risk, inner city kids. And um, I just started reaching out to high schools, started reaching out to continuations. How did you do that, Danny? Some people are listening to this and they may not have the moxie that you have, the ability to just reach out and make things happen. So give them a little bit of a roadmap. I what did you do to reach out? I would start reaching out to all the juvenile halls that were local in LA and Orange County. And what did you, how did you reach out? What did uh, you do? I would Google them and I would call the front desk and the front desk will send me to someone and then someone send me to someone and then it just kept trickling down. And, um, and that's, that's what it, how it would happen. And then, and then from one person, they're like, Hey, can you speak over here? And then this person, it just got, and then it just got word of mouth. And, um, and now it's like, I'm so blessed to be, to be able to do this. Like I have to slow down because it's like, I can literally go to a lot of us. Uh, I can go to a lot more schools than I can handle at the moment. So, um, just taking it slow and, um, you know, just giving back. That's the main thing, giving back, making a difference and changing lives. You are doing a lot of that, Danny. And have you written your story yet? Not yet. And why is it going to be important for you to read, read your, write your story? Um, it's very important that I should write my story, um, you know, getting a book together. Let me tell you, let me give you a little bit of suggestion, Danny. You're a young man. You've, you've, you've overcome enormous hurdles. You're an incredible success now selling millions of dollars worth of real estate, making dreams come true for young family members. But you're also making dreams come true for people who don't have any confidence, who don't have any hope. And you, they're going to see hope. And you will create a lot of value by writing your book, writing a story of how you found good mentors, how you found uh, leadership in, in literature, how you came home and didn't revert to the type of behavior that leads so many people back into the criminal justice system, but instead climbed your way from landscaping jobs to Costco jobs to finding a mentor who would take you under his uh, tutelage so that you could learn real estate. And now you are the man. And we're just so grateful to have you as a neighbor and as a friend and as a leader in our community that's helping other young people make good decisions. Awesome. Yeah, it's a, it's a blessing. It is a blessing. And it's a blessing for us at Prison Professors to be able to tell your story. And what I'd love to do, Danny, is, is stay in touch with you um, so that we can perhaps work together, collaborate together. And if you haven't written yet, maybe you would consider writing an article a little bit about your journey for readers of Prison Professors, and we could start the publication process right here. Yeah, no, I would love to. And, and I know um, you can probably help me out with getting that going. I can help you out. In fact, after this uh, video call, I'm going to give you an assignment and see if you follow through with it because I, I would like nothing more than to have you featured on our website as a prison, as, as, an, as an associate prison professor, joining my, uh, my partner, Sean Hopwood and, and me and uh, helping more people achieve their highest potential. Yeah, I love that. That's what we're going to do. So uh, Danny, this is the, uh, the end of our episode today. Do you have any final words that you'd like to share with our audience? Um, never give up. You know, really anything is possible. If you're really inspired and you really want to do something that you, can, you will make it happen. And let me ask you, Danny, if any of our uh, listeners or, or, or viewers or readers, because we're going to put this on the, on the uh, blog as well, want to purchase a home in Orange County or Los Angeles, how do they get in touch with you? So um, I work Los Angeles and Orange County, um, and my direct line is 
6633. And, and I'm, uh, I'm going to put that on our on the header of this show so that people can find you. Maybe you'll give us your email address as well. Yes. It'll be right on the banner. You'll see it right up there. So uh, if you want to connect with Danny directly, whether to invite him to come to your school, whether you want to look, whether you're looking for a dynamic keynote speaker and you want to bring him in to support his efforts, that's, I know that Danny, Danny, I doubt you get paid for going into all the schools, right? Yeah, no, I don't, I actually don't, I mean, donate, I donate, so. Does it as a community service volunteering. So if you are with the National Realtor Board or any corporate organization that needs a dynamic speaker, if somebody knows how to close deals, you want to bring Danny Navarro into your organization so he can uh, coach salespeople and the, the fee that you pay him can go towards supporting his ministry of helping other at-risk youth come out successfully. It's a great opportunity to help David achieve his goals. I would suggest that you start off at a speaking fee of no less than $5,000. Contact Danny Navarro so that he can sow seeds for good. How's that sound, Danny? Thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful. That's good. We're going to happen. So we're going to write these stories and we're going to connect people to you. We hope that's what we're going to do, but we know that you're going to continue changing lives and we're very grateful to you for doing so. And if you're a viewer outside in society, I really encourage you to reach out to Danny and thank him for his enormous contribution. I also encourage you to subscribe to us on YouTube so that you can get these videos piped up to you whenever you want. You will see nothing but success after prison. If you stay tuned to the prison professor's uh, website, visit us, like us on Facebook, let us uh, spread the message that regardless of what struggles you're facing today, you can come back to be successful, just like Danny Navarro. Yep. Make it happen. I'm yeah. Michael with prisonprofessors.com. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll be back soon with another inspiring guest. Have a wonderful day. There we go, brother. Hold on. Stop recording. Awesome. That was fun. Yeah.